morning, folks. So just a few announcements right at the beginning. If you just look to your right-hand side of uh, the pews at the front, you'll see the palm crosses. And what I ask is that during, once you come up for communion, for this after, once you come up for communion during the service, as you are going back to your seats, you can pick up one or more palm crosses. Please pick up a few because obviously we have a few extra. Uh, and so uh, that will be the time you pick up the palm crosses. The service will flow as looking at me. Anything? Okay. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the service will begin from the back, and of course, uh, you can look at the slides up there at the front or the back of the church. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the high. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Dear friends in Christ, during Lent we have been preparing for the celebration of our Lord's Paschal Mystery. On this day, our Lord Jesus Christ entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph. The people welcomed him with palms and shouts of praise, but the path before him led to self-giving, suffering, and death. Today we greet him as our king, although we know his crown is thorns and his throne cross. We follow him this week from the glory of the palms to the glory of the resurrection by way of the dark road of suffering and death. United with him in his suffering on the cross, may we share his resurrection and new life. Let us pray. Assist us mercifully with your help, Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy in the celebration of those mighty acts whereby you give us life and immortality. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Just say this, The Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said, to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Almighty God, for the acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The Hebrews acclaim Jesus as Messiah and King with palm branches in their hands, crying, Hosanna in the highest. May we also, carrying these emblems, go forth to meet Christ and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who lives and reigns in glory with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us go forth in peace. Amen.
May we, walking in the way of the cross, find it is for us the way of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be... Oh, actually, I call it yet. <laughs> Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, in tender love for all our human race, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take our flesh and suffer death upon a cruel cross. May we follow the example of his great humility and share in the glory of his resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, please be seated for the days. Our first reading, a reading from the book of Isaiah. The Lord God had given me the tongue as a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will, declare, who will declare me guilty? Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Our psalm for today is Psalm 31, to be read responsively. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye wastes away from grief, my soul and body also. I am the scorn of all my adversaries, a horror to my neighbors, an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. For I hear the whispering of many, terror all around, as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, Lord. I say you are my God. Many times are in, my times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and per persecutors. Our second reading, a reading from the letter of Paul to the, Phil to the Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard uh, equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall, should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Let us pray. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this morning we celebrate Palm Sunday. This is Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. What is Jesus going to do? He is going to establish the kingdom of God. He is going to overturn the power of the rulers of this world. He is going to draw, that is to conform people, to himself so that people might be residents, citizens of the kingdom of heaven. This is what Jesus Christ is inaugurating. This is what his entry into Jerusalem is about. This is what Palm Sunday is about. So I would be therefore very remiss if I did not recognize and speak out about the stark contrast, an utter contradiction to be precise, between the kingdom building of Vladimir Putin and the kingdom building of God. We know the story well today. Jesus asks his disciples to bring him a colt, a humble donkey. Recognize what this is not. This is not a war horse. He does not come in with soldiers. He does not come in with swords. In fact, he heals someone whose ear is cut off with a sword. He heals an enemy whose ear one of his disciples cuts off with a sword. He does not blow apart. He does not torture or murder. When the disciples ask that, him if they should punish his enemies, he says no. He does not condemn those who betray or fail to follow him fully. Instead, he rides into Jerusalem in humility turning a righteous cheek when falsely accused. And he prepares to establish the truth, the kingdom of God, by doing what? By willingly laying down his life. All the way to the cross, he lays down his own life his claim. He lays down his own life, makes himself lower than the angels for a little while, Hebrews says to us. Why? So that both his friends, his neighbors, and his enemies might have true life. Do you see the contrast there? Jesus does say, yes, there is a truth. Yes, you are not living righteously. Yes, you belong to me. You belong to me, Jesus says. But he does not get there with violence. He does not get there with a war horse. He does not get there by going in and blowing up or bombing or killing or torturing. He gets there by laying down his own life. Jesus' willing self-sacrifice not only, therefore, defines what true power is versus the false power of human war and violence that leads only to further violence and death. His self-sacrifice even to death on the cross for the sake of all human beings, friend and enemy, defines what it is to be truly human, to be a true ruler, to have true power. Everything else is sin. 
And that is the claim that I will make. The war, the incursion, the invasion of another country is not righteous. It is not good. It has no heavenly value. It has no correspondence to the truth because it is the opposite of who God is, for it is the opposite of what God does. It is sin, pure and simple. And while I am certainly pointing out a glaring public example of a contradiction between living in accordance with God's kingdom and its opposite, Lent is a time not merely to point out sin in general or the sin of another, but to recognize that that impetus, that ability, that way of going wrong is in all of us. We are all, we are all guilty of sin, all of us, in a myriad of ways. Obviously, with everybody sitting in here, it is not going and invading another country. Or at least, I'm not aware that any of you are involved in that. Certainly not. But all of us have entered into relationships, have been in relationships, have engaged in actions and words, in thoughts, in ways of being that contradict who God is because they contradict what God has done. And so, fortunately, I have plenty of fodder for the exercise of the self-examination that is supposed to come in Lent. So let me get into that. Last year, following an unrelated surgery, I developed a muscle strain in my right leg as I tried to return to running and cycling. Now, I've been running and cycling for most of my life, pretty much every day for at least an hour. And they're like oxygen to me. They're necessary for living, so I think. And so I felt really exhilarated to get out this past Saturday on my bike, to get back with my teammates and to get a ride in. The difficulty is that in the past, I had been pushing too hard too quickly. That is, I had refused to be patient and measured, to have self-control. And this, throughout the last year, had resulted in soreness and eventually in an inability to walk more than a kilometer to sleep properly, or to climb stairs. I had to stop training altogether for weeks at a time. And of course, being fearful that I had lost fitness, control, autonomy, meaning and purpose, and even prowess amidst my friend groups. When I started to come back from the injury, I once again went too hard, too quickly. And you can guess the result. Now, this cyclical pattern of desiring control and autonomy and meaning and purpose and prowess, in other words, my ego, seems to be a constant thing, a constant struggle for me. I bet you have your own ways of having that play out. This past Saturday, I got out for my first longer outing in a year and a half. At around kilometer 60, I started feeling some pain in my right leg. And I was suddenly, at that point, struck by the analogous relationship occurring between my training and injury cycle, and our cycle of opening up from COVID, and then being shut down again. Because, of course, we just couldn't bear any more load. Piled on top of this was the horror unfolding as Russian troops invade, torture, and massacre Ukrainians in an attempt to 
to enforce them to conform to Putin's falsely conceived and dangerous nostalgia of, pur of purity and tradition. In all of this, I'd grown weary. In all of it, I'd grown weary. I felt helpless, struggling into hopelessness that things would ever get better or get to a point where I, where we, could get some traction, set a new baseline, or see any forward progress where human beings are inspired to freely be able to make sacrifices toward enabling others to flourish. This was, of course, bound to a novel realization for most millennials, the realization of how truly finite, unknowing, complicated, and broken we are as a species. These things, they're really, they are very often hidden by our daily duties, by the ways that we distract ourselves to avoid the pain of looking long and hard at how we act, at how we treat other people, at whether or not the things that we've learned and that we've been conditioned by in part of our society are actually in line with God's will. Even if our interpretation of Scripture is in line with God's will, are actually more like the culture that we've grown up in. And of course, it's always exacerbated by the confusion of media, whether traditional media or social media, it's often intended to sell rather than to challenge people to think really critically. And it was at that point, geographically somewhere out on the constructed breakwater named Leslie Spit that juts out five kilometers into Lake Ontario, that in my head I heard the words of Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me? Will you forget us forever? How long will you hide your face from us? Look at what's going on. How long must I take counsel in my own soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day long? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? The enemy, of course, is both within us and outside us. The enemy is our own ignorance, our dwelling in uncertainty, no matter how much we know. The enemy is also outside of us. It's a virus that has swept the globe, as has happened thousands of times through history. The enemy is the antithesis of Christ's transformative love that took not the form of violence and war and invasion, but rather of laying down his life for his friends, moreover for his enemies, for those who betrayed him, for those who doubted and walked away, for those who embodied violence themselves. The enemy is indifference to this. Yes, it is happening in the Ukraine, but how many of you know how much has happened in Africa? how civil wars have torn apart entire populations, how millions have died in civil wars linked to the church's witness there. How many of you are aware of that? Not thousands, millions. A massacre of entire groups of people. Same has happened in South America, in Central America. The same has happened throughout history. And the enemy is indifference to that historical reality, our inability to examine it and what caused it, our unwillingness to lift our heads and see who we really are, what our words and our actions cause in this world. 
The enemy is also doubt, though, that becomes hopelessness, grounded in the feeling of being helpless. Helplessness, hopelessness, that robs people of their Christ-likeness, snuffing out the Great Commission to go out from our fear when we feel hopeless and helpless, our fear of mere fleshly survival, to act with courage and perseverance in helping others. And the psalm, it came to me again. Consider and answer me, O my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I've prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. And I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt, dealt bountifully with me. Those were the words from Psalm 13 that rushed into my head. The brokenness of my own humanity and of all the humanity of which I am a part. And the hope, the hope that is the outcome of this day, of laying one's down one's life for one's neighbor and one's enemy. Perhaps this is why God gave running and cycling to me, I thought. At least for the time I will have them. To learn what it is to face trials that break down and build up and break down again with no certainty of my own progress. No certainty that I can get myself there. No certainty that I will continue on to be a good cyclist. That my body will break down. That my heart and my mind, it will break down. That I am utterly, utterly dependent upon God's action. Maybe God gave me cycling to learn the humility of dependence upon God's provision for a given time and place, even when I'm looking through that glass darkly, as St. Paul puts it. Through these things, I have learned to face into a world of figurative injury, as well as literal. A world where sin and natural evils still affect every aspect of our lives. And yet a world into which Christ has entered as a healing balm. A physiotherapist, to better fit my analogy. To bear me up so that I will take another step, another push of the pedals toward that heavenly kingdom whose foretaste we are called to succor until he reconciles all things. To go out into my daily life, for you all to go out into your daily lives with creativity, courage, and humanity. To pick up your cross, to limp, to hobble, to take a painless step and then a second, to swing one's legs, slowly pushing around crank arms until the power meter registered wattage progress. To press on, that is, with patience, humility, knowing that you do not know all, and compassion for others, rather than with ego and worldly anxiety. Not so that I can win a world tour or be intellectually competent or win but so that we can support and build up our communities, our city, our country, our province, our teams, our friends, our spouses, our children and grandchildren. To endure trials, to learn what really matters in life, to learn that it is not all about me or about us, until our sacrifices that have starved us of human interaction, of goods, of jobs, of vaccines, received even where it is discomfort, we have discomfort over it, to risk and so fear 
in so doing. To allow the widow, the old, the sick, to make those sacrifices, even when we are afraid, even when we are unsure, even when we are uncomfortable or angry, to be willing to sacrifice as Christ sacrificed. I don't want to take this cup, Lord. I don't want to do these things. I am afraid. To be willing to make those sacrifices so that we can allow the widow, the old, the sick, the weak, to come out from their figurative tomb of home isolation. Now, I am spurred on, or perhaps back from the literal and figurative lighthouse at the end of the breakwater at Leslie Spit. Spurred on by the lighthouse of Christ who illuminates a path of warning about selfish conceit and ambition fueled by ego insecurity but also a lighthouse who illuminates a safe haven, a true and physical break from those treacherous floodwaters in which we might otherwise drown when we experience exhaustion, frustration, confusion, pain, hurt, fear, and the desire for everything to go back to where it once was. When we falsely presumed that it was all good. That lighthouse, that Leslie Spit breakwater, provide a great analogy for Jesus Christ with us. The God-man who comes to us, himself frail, very human, hobbling on a very lowly donkey, the antithesis of a soldier on a horse or in a tank or in a fighter jet on Palm Sunday. The God-man who carries his cross. It is this one who is our physical breakwater, our real and true remission from the flood waters of sin and death. The lighthouse that gives both, that, that both gives to us and shows us the truth of life. To live not for ourselves, burying our talents out on that spit, but to give our own talents back to God with interest, returning, that is, from the spit, from the breakwater of Christ into the dangerous and confusing and sometimes frightening world, so that we can help others to God's safe shores. Amen.
believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please make yourselves comfortable. The prayers of the people, your response to let us pray to the Lord, is hear us, Lord of glory. Lord, like the crowd that met you at Bethany, we rejoice at the approach of Easter. And like that crowd, we often think we understand what you are doing and then feel disappointed. In this final week before Easter, Give us grace to travel with you on your journey to the cross. Time to clear our minds and hearts of things that clutter our inner temples. Setting aside other ambitions, that this Easter we may rise with you to new life and truly come alive to grace. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord, Lord. We pray for your church that the events of the past two years will provide the incentive to clear our patterns of worship of unnecessary baggage, bringing new light and a new way forward to meet the spirit needs of your people. We give thanks for the new way forward that has opened up for the indigenous peoples. We pray that this will bring new life and new hope to those who have suffered so much. We pray for our bishops, Andrew, Rosilla, and Kevin, for our priest, Lee, and for those who serve us in this church. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord, Lord. We pray for all our fellow parishioners, especially for those we have missed seeing these past two years, and for those who are thinking of finding a place of worship. This week, we pray for Messiah, Hayden, Gisla, Jennifer, and John, and for those who have asked for our prayers, Cindy, Karen, Sheila, Robbie, Chris, Margaret, Brenda, and Dan. We ask that you would continue to work in their lives in a healing and restoring way, giving them strength and courage to move forward. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord. We pray for our world, for families that have been torn apart by war, for refugees struggling to reach our shores and a safe place to live. We pray for world leaders, giving thanks for the efforts being made to resolve the turmoil of violence, starvation, and suffering. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord, Lord. Gracious God, you have heard the prayers of your people. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Grant our request as may be best for us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Have 
mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Please stand as you will. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Folks, our offertory hymn this morning is hymn number 377, the name of our son.
in calling the Israelites of the Old Testament scriptures to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be, the inc to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, a death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, our Lord Jesus Christ took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, according to his command, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray, you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we, made acceptable in him, may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ, and make them new. And bring us to that city of light where you dwell with all your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. We break this bread. Let your church be the wheat which bears its fruit in dying. If we have died with him, we shall live with him. If we hold firm, we shall reign with him. The gifts of God for you, the people of God.
Let's stand together. In our prayer after communion, let us pray. God, our help and strength, you have satisfied our hunger with this Eucharistic food. Strengthen our faith that through the death and resurrection of your Son, we may be led to salvation. For he is Lord now and forever. Amen. And together, glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you on this Palm Sunday for this Holy Week and through to Easter Day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So just a few uh, quick announcements that um, I, think, I think I've already done. Um, so we will not have a Monday Thursday service this uh, this year, um, just because it's it's complicated in terms of uh, logistics and in terms of, of numbers and volunteers for doing it. So, um, so we won't be doing. There are a number of, of parishes in the di or in this particular area that are doing it. Um, so, if you do want to attend a Monday Thursday service, um, there are Monday thir Thursday services that you can get to, um, and, and do that. So, we will have a Good Friday service. That's 10 a.m. on Good Friday. And then we will have an awesome service on Sunday because, of course, it is Easter. But in addition to Easter, we will be baptizing young Zara, who is at the back of the church, who won't pay well. You can, you can turn around and look. Young Zara, who's going to be baptized uh, on, on Sunday. <laughs> well, that sounds like a confirmation of what we can say there um, so, so uh, it will be a wonderful time. It's going to be a lovely celebration. Um, having a baptism at Easter is always a, a glorious experience because, of course, this is the time when we celebrate our new lives in Jesus Christ and we move from to the penitential uh, phase of the Christian year into a year of celebrating what it is that Christ has brought into our life um, and that he has made us new. Um, delivered us from sin and death. So, um, so hopefully our, our church will be filled with love, peace, joy, hope, um, and, uh, and we'll be able to celebrate on Sunday. So um, service will be obviously a little bit longer than normal, as you're probably aware of hers, um, but, uh, but it should be lovely, and I'll try to keep the homily short. So um, I think that's it. Are there any announcements from the community? Wonderful. Let us stand together. Our recessional hymn this morning is hymn number 181, All Glory, Law, and Honor. Sing it out. This is a well-known one.
to receive and to give God's love. And thank you to God.